Welcome to What's the Risk, hosted by myself, Daniel Crow, and Peter Mansell, founder of Mansell Financial Group, a financial advice business he founded in 1980. This is a simple video series we hope investors can use to better understand index and portfolio performance, along with addressing some investment questions and dilemmas. This episode is on the MSCI World X Australia Small Cap Index with net dividends reinvested. Uh, some people would know the ETF that seeks to track the return of this index as Vanguard's VISM or VISM, and it's just under 4,000 small cap companies in 22 developed markets. So your investment philosophy, a book we wrote, shameless plug, available on Amazon. Disclaimer, please pause and read. Suffice to say our intent is educational and not rendering financial advice. Don't make us tap the sign. These are simple concepts. We'd like investors to better understand performance in the short and long term so they can make informed decisions. Periodic performance. Obviously, this only goes back to 1999 with the inception of the index. And I've included the MSCI World X Australia Index, which is global large to mid caps for comparison. Um, over the longer periods, there's some outperformance by the small caps in this time period. And we think it's probably important that investors are aware of this. Yeah, Daniel, I think that uh, there's uh, a couple of really stark lessons here. And the first is that, you know, for the period of the last decade, large cap growth stocks in particular worldwide have been the darlings for investors and they have outperformed. Now, that does not mean that the theory behind why small caps should outperform has changed. In fact, I would argue quite the reverse. You can see in the 20 and 25 year numbers, small caps have outperformed large caps over those two respective periods. Uh, then when we have a look at the 40 year numbers and the since inception numbers, uh, you can see we're looking at two very different inception dates, so you can't really draw a conclusion from those. Uh, but I, I just want to remind everybody listening to this message that the reason why small cap stocks should and do outperform over longer periods is because of the inherent difference between them and large cap stocks. And it all stems back to investors may at times be irrational, but most investors will only rationalise to take extra risk if they believe they're going to get a reward. And when you look at the underlying characteristics of large cap growth stocks, which are usually quite old, dominant in their marketplaces, price makers rather than price takers, generally trying to do more with less people. Small cap stocks, on the other hand, tend to be younger. They don't tend to have reliable profit histories. They tend to not be dominant in their marketplace. They tend to be price takers rather than price makers. They are, by nature, riskier companies than the large cap growth stocks. And because they're riskier, investors will only invest in them if they believe they're going to get a higher rate of return. So to me, it is genuinely a risk and reward story. And whilst for periods of any time up to sort of 10 years, yes, large cap growth stocks could outperform. In the longer run, ignoring small caps is something any investor does to their own peril. I've included this calendar year slide and we'll see why that outperformance over those longer two 20 and 25 year periods exists from 1999 to 2005 small beat large and it did pretty well until 2018 now this isn't meant to be an exhausting deep dive into into data with this it's just calendar year returns but you'll see a lot of investors today dismissing global small caps because of the tail end of this table on the on the bottom right hand side, this is why you'd caution on recency bias because the same people at the end of 2005 or end of 2017 would probably be doing the same thing and increasing their exposure or to small at the expense of large. I think this listing of individual yearly results has got a number of really good lessons in it, as you rightly pointed out. The first seven years, it's all in favour of small caps. Now, that's an excessively good run that at some point has to come to an end. Now, the global financial crisis comes along in six, seven, and eight, and what happens? Investors panic and they throw out the small cap stocks far more violently and far more definitively than they do with the large cap stocks. Lo and behold, the large cap stocks do better over that three-year period. Then small caps come back into favour for some seven out of the next nine years, and so over that whole period of time, that that uh, 
18, 19 years, small caps handsomely win. Well, it was time for large caps to have their turn in the sun, and they have over the last six years. But if you use just that data to make your decisions, you're ignoring all the fundamentals of why smalls will outperform, as I just alluded to a minute or two ago. The growth of wealth, this highlights what we're talking about. Small di didn't suffer the same loss a decade as large did. And we're not advocating for one over the other, just the investors should keep this in mind when chasing returns based on recency bias and concentrating on what's been hot lately. Concentrating on what's been hot lately has very, very rarely served investors well. Small caps, investing in them, absolutely critical to a some to some extent within any equity portfolio, not to the exclusion of large, far from it. And range of returns, a little bit more traditional looking, I guess you'd call the funnel of doubt, moves in without any any anomalies there. And absolutely. at worst... This, yeah, sorry, Daniel, this is absolutely, uh, this is a classic example of what is supposed to happen over any longer period of time. And we've got 24 25 calendar years here, and the one-year result is exactly as you'd expect. The distance between the best result and the average is very, very close to the distance between the average and the bottom result. Um, over three years, similar pattern. Over five years, similar pattern. Over 10 years, similar pattern. And the 20-year numbers, very much as you would expect. Uh, rolling annual returns, uh, what you'd expect over this period of time. I small recovered much better coming out of the GFC, which put more space between it and large, which uh, obviously didn't happen post-COVID. And, and that made sense too, because small caps were sold off far worse during the GFC. Investors tended to hang on to their large blue chip stocks, thinking that they'd be the ones that would survive, you know, the, uh, the GFC downturn, whereas they tended to dispense with the small cap stocks far more violently and, and far more definitively. Uh, but when you look at the, the chart that's in front of us, the downturn uh, that appears first on the left, the second of the Gulf Wars, then we come to the global financial crisis. We move further right over to the right. You can see COVID. Every one of those periods of downturn are absolutely what you'd expect, given the circumstances that was face that were facing, you know, the global economy and the geopolitical situations over those very very difficult times. Yeah, historic chance of positive and negative. So no negative ten year periods, but unlike other indices, we've only only got data here going back to nineteen ninety nine. But it's pretty much the progression you'd expect over that type of time frame. Absolutely, this chart looks exactly the way we'd expect. Four months out of ten go backwards. Uh, then when you come to quarters, it's roughly two thirds, one third. You know, when we look at the yearly results, it's 70, 30 and, and down from there. Uh, this is you know, traditionally what I'd expect from or, or something close to this is what I'd expect from any stock market analysis. The largest fall and time to recovery. If we remember the MSCI world, it had a double dip through the 2000s. Small did yes. too, but it was much smaller and, and the worst of it was... In the GFC. So do you have any thoughts on why small was not caught up as badly in the 2000s underperformance like large, Peter, around maybe do you think it was not as many dot-com companies earlier on in the piece or? It, it, it could well have been, you know, lack of exposure to dot-coms. It can also be a random event insofar as if if investors had, had previously sold off small cop caps really dramatically, um, Sometimes investors get to a point where they go, well, it's gone that badly now, surely it can't get any worse. So they don't continue to sell. In fact, I've seen a very good uh, academic paper on exactly that, that, that there comes a point where investors surrender to how bad things have got and, and conclude, well, it just can't get any worse. And, and I think that when it came to small cap stocks, there might have been a little bit of that in uh, the fact that there wasn't really that severe double dip. Risk return of the efficient frontier, and here small um, comes with a more volatility. It's more akin to over, over the time frame. It's been in, in existence, more akin to the ASX 300 in performance with risk and return. For reference there, the MSCI world, 
ex Australia in the in the red, obviously only about a five and a half percent return. I think that that's uh, in some respects dictated to by the the starting point of the data series that is 1999. Mm. But most importantly, when you look at that, the MSCI X Oz small cap index nearly as profitable as the ASX, barely more volatile than the ASX. Uh, I think that the position on that chart alone is enough reason to include at least a modest exposure to small caps in any diversified portfolio. And sources and descriptions of data. So again, thanks for your time. Okay. Thanks, Daniel, and bye for now.